Well, we could walk about, get the psychological advantage. Uh, I do want to say, I do want to say that, excuse me, I'm talking. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say that, firstly, I really do appreciate you coming along here to listen to what I have to say and take an interest in my life because it was 19 years ago since I broke that Barodeo record. So the fact that you've come along here and took an interest, uh, I do appreciate it. Now, can I ask, how many people have seen the film called The Flying Scotsman? Oh my goodness, more than half of you. How many folk have read the book? Quite a few. Some haven't. So I do, I'm not only really asking because I see what kind of audience, quite a knowledgeable audience, obviously. So what kind of questions, what kind of things you want to hear me talk about? Because I'm not going to just go and regurgitate the guts of my book when you've read it already. So I'm going to talk about, and it's good to see there's, there's quite a wide range of people here. Quite a few young people. Good to see young people get involved in cycling. Well done. Now, I could talk about how did I really, really get down to breaking that record? A lot of people come and they want to hear me speak because a lot of people think, what did he have that other people didn't? That what, 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 what's it about him that he was world champion and world record holder and made those positions and why didn't other people? So we don't have that much time, so I'm going to go back to 1992. I kind of know the story, I was a teenager, took up cycling, loved it, became obsessed with it, bike shops. I, 1986, sat in a bike shop and I thought, I was looking at my time trial bike and I hate bike shops, so that's terrible to say at a bike show, but I, I hate bike shops, sorry, I hate owning bike shops, because people come in and talk to you constantly. I, and you're trying to get bikes fixed and there's the same conversation over and over and I want to go and ride bikes. So, sat there thinking, I hate bike shops, looking at my time trial bike and thinking, how can I go faster on that bike? Not just the bike. Well, I realised it's not about the bike. I thought, I'm thinking about the bike. If you're just thinking about the bike, how can I make a faster bike? I thought, how can I make something that's faster with me on it? Then I thought, what about me and the bike as one unit? One, like, like Black Beauty or something, is like me and this bike as one thing. Then I thought, well, the laws of physics, take the arms out of the airstream, and then that me and the bike together would be more aerodynamic. I thought, right, I'm having it out the door with it. Handlebars turned up like a paper boy. And, and, and then I just started racing on it. I thought, I'm doing that, having it, racing on it. Raced on that till, well, raced, uh, well, that was right up until I got banned in 1994. That was eight years I rode that position. But I actually heard, this is absolutely true, um, I went out the first race on that bike, 1986, 10 mile time trial, straight out, straight back. And luckily at the time, it wasn't until two years afterwards that I heard this story come back to me that. The policeman at the turn, I turned round to the turn marshal and said, because my, my riding position was like that. It was like top 10, like a ski tuck position except on the bike. And the, the policeman turned round to the marshal and said, look at that poor bloke, and somebody's built a bike for him special. <laughs> but undeterred, I decided I was going to go quicker and quicker. So, but I didn't actually, I, I was at a British level and I thought, this is great. I'm winning Scottish races, racing Chris Bowman at British level, 89 to 92, and it goes, that's, things that's fine. 1992 comes the point, now, if you've read the book, The Flying Scotsman, or seen the film, I can tell you there were pages like, ripped out of my original account, um, for legal purposes. <laughs> but I can now bring to you today, I bring to you today. Here we go. <laughs> an embellishment of a, uh, of, of, uh, of, 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 of a gist of what was actually missing from those pages. 1982, Chris Boardman, MBE, wins Olympic gold. Graham O'Brien, his bike shop has passed away because uh, the Christmas it never came. I don't know if there's anybody old enough here, but uh, had a bike shop or anything like that. 
but in you speak to, they had a bike shop, Christmas 1991, there wasn't a Christmas. Left the bikes, it was a bad time for the trade, it wasn't like the day of the boom times, this is what was like, bikes left over, and I hated bike shops. Wrote away to 50 companies saying about me and the uh, British hour record holder and the uh, a multiple Scottish champion and what my endeavours were and an aspiration to break the amateur hour record, which is 48 kilometres, and I'd done 46. 50. Right away to big companies like Heinz and all those biggest companies, right through the, the list of companies, nothing. Not a single letter back, nothing. So then a sponsor approaches me in the last days of my shop and transferring stock over to people and things um, to close the shop down. Said, I'll sponsor you. I'll sponsor you. I own a hotel. Um, I come and stay at my hotel sometimes and stuff like that. Stay the kind of base there. We'll, 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 we'll go. We'll just we'll throw money at it. We'll, we'll attack Ekimov's world hour record, 48 kilometers. I thought, right, I'm having it. It's on. But it turns out accidentally that um, as Chris Boardman was winning his gold medal, that I discovered that my sponsor didn't actually own the hotel and the gun under the pillow and uh, uh, well let's say it ended up being an anti-sponsor, like a sponsor that leaves you with debts in your name uh, and a screwdriver beside the door. Uh, that wasn't good. So at this moment, you probably read about this, I then goes, you know what, I'm never riding again. This has come to this point of, I've got a wee boy, uh, my shop's closed down, I've got debts in my name, no world record to my name, it was manana manana, and I'm never riding again. I, and it was so poor, I tried to pay these debts off, a, one, a couple of pounds at a time, or a fiver at a time, or something like that, with no prospects, with these debts left to me by the sponsor, the anti-sponsor, that I thought, never riding again. Then, then, 1st of January, 1993, walking along a beach in the winter's day, the west coast of Scotland. I turned around to Anne and I said, you know what? I'm going to break Moser's hour record. 51.151 kilometers. And she said, well, it's totally, 100% on. And I can honestly say this, this is absolutely true. When I turned around and said that, it was clear in my mind that I will take that. It's clear as lifting a coffee cup down from a shelf. I'm having that. And two seconds later, I knew that I wasn't good enough. But I still knew that I was going to break it because I was going to make myself good enough. But you think, is that arrogance? But it's not arrogance, it's like sometimes I just so you'd think I will make myself good enough. You know what you know what I boil it down to? I don't think I've, I've mentioned this in my book, uh, or the it wasn't mentioned in the film. But I looked at Francesca Moza and Francesca Moza was a hero of mine. And it was the ultimate time trial in Mexico City in 1984. And I thought, you know what? He's got two arms and two legs. And I thought, you know what? I'm qualified. No, seriously, I'm qualified. And I'm, I'll suffer more than that Italian did. For Jessica Moser, they're all respecting everything, but you know what, I'll suffer more than you did, and I'll train harder than you did, and I've got an idea for my bike, and I'm building my bike. I, okay, I don't know how I'm building it, because I've, I've no money and no materials, but I will find a way of building that bike, and I'm having that record. That's exactly what I thought. And the rest, as they say, is history. So, when you went to break this world hour record, did you go with a thought of, I'm going to go and get as close to him as I can? Or did you get on the track, because you did it, you tried to break it and then went back to your room and then went back and broke it. Did you always think, well, I'm just, I'm going to break it? Was it, was it like there was, there was no question? It was, I'm breaking it, there is no going no. back, that's it. You never try to break a world record. Try is a three-letter word for an excuse for, I'm just about to fail to do this. Try is, is the word that doesn't come into my vocabulary. It shouldn't come into your vocabulary. Uh, until afterwards. <laughs> until afterwards you go, well, I tried.
but you don't try beforehand, because then you will all be saying, I tried afterwards. No, I stepped up to break that hour record. And to be honest, absolutely how it went down. Because if you've seen the film, and you've seen that bit, and people sometimes ask me, what do you think, if you had to nub, if that film had a meaning or soul, would it actually fundamental, what the good crux the heart of that film is? The, the heart of that film, and the director, Douglas McKinnon, I can still remember, sta okay, remember him standing in an empty velodrome during the making of the film in 2005, staring at seven o'clock in the morning, staring into space, in an empty velodrome, and he said, this is the crux of the film. Like, you didn't get the record one day and you got it the next. How can I audio visually transmit to people the feeling of how a human being can change from you not getting that record and then come back more tired but a different psychological being and to have it back? How can I transmit that audio visually in a film, a feature film to people? Well, the truth is, I stepped out that morning, but I got woken up, oh, well, I need to get up, the press is here. So I got up at seven o'clock with the press. France two and France one and other people were there. There was quite a lot of interest in this, this yeah. record attempt. I think it was the 16th of July. Filmed eat my breakfast. Filmed doing a bit of stretching. Filmed warming up. Filmed going to the track. I filmed doing more warm up. Filmed warming down. Filmed warming up. And all the time, people are saying, oh, listen, this is a big deal, oh, you know, this is good luck, you know, you, you can do this, like that. But they're all saying that. And of course I know I can do it, because I've trained more than that. Italian guy, Francesco, good guy, hero, but I've got two arms and two legs, and I'm going to suffer more. So I'm having that record. But come the start line, after everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, it's a big one, and then and uh, more warm-up, and more television, and more media, then I find myself in the start line of a foreign track about to attack Francesco Moser's 1984 Mexico City era record, the most iconic thing, picture on my wall of Francesco with his, his aero helmet, disc wheels, there. And the timekeepers hold me up and he said, and now I've got to explain it, there was a whole lot of audience in there was seven timekeepers on the table kind of to my left, and the Mr. Starter hold me up. So Mr. Starter goes, take a deep breath, just remember this is the big one. Francesca Moser's 94 hour record, I thought, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and my palms are sweating, and my heart's pumping before even done any exercise. I was like, oh, this is it, this is the big one. I was like, Francesca Moser's the hour record, 1984. And then I thought, right, just whenever you're ready, just take a deep breath, but remember, this is the big one. And then I kind of thought, thought about it for a bit and thought, right, there, uh, compose yourself, right, okay, okay, uh, right, 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 I'm ready, I'm ready. So I'll give you a countdown. Started off, and it wasn't so far off the pace. It was like half a lap and then half a lap down. And I thought, an amazing 10 minutes, an amazing 10 minutes at the end, I'll get this back, I'll be right on track, it'll go bang, just, I'll beat it by one second and I'll be back on track. I'm only like, three quarters of a lap or something down out of 208 laps. I thought a really, 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 really fast finish, but it didn't happen. I come off that track and I'd broken the world sea level record that Francesca Moser held, because she'd done it at altitude. And he'd also held the world sea level record from Stuttgart in Germany, uh, which I'd beaten. Mm -hmm. So the French, this is exactly how it went down. France to went to hand me a bunch of flowers and go, oh, congratulations. And at that moment, something clicked. That was the moment that this, suddenly I was the West Coast of Scotland guy, oh, 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 I'm attacking Francesco Moser's record, like that. I was that guy all day. When they went to hand me those flowers, suddenly, I was the guy with two arms and two legs that was gonna beat this record again. I guess I'm not having that. I don't want those flowers, I'm going again. I'll go again this afternoon, it's, it's, I came here for the World Hour Record. The World Hour Record. And just, but, 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 but you can't, you just, no, no, I'm going again. That's not good enough. So that was a psychological change like that. What did you do over, like, overnight to change from 
Because it, it never gets really documented that you broke that record, does it? It was like, he rode, he didn't do it, overnight something changed, and then he went back and broke it. So what, what did happen? How, how do you recover from breaking a sea level world hour record sufficiently to go out and break the world hour record? Well, physiologically, you don't recover. You've just done an hour of 400 and something watts. So you're actually, you're actually, you feel that. So, and the, the fact is because, only because I'm experienced from, um, I rode a 10 mile time trial and then the national 50 championship a few weeks before it. I got the 10 record and then the 50 record back to back. I don't know if you remember that. But really what you've got to do in that situation is don't rest. You've got to be like a shark, keep swimming, keep moving. Because if you, if you lie down for more than an hour or a couple of hours, then your muscles can seize up. So basically, I thought, I had two options. I could either rest properly in terms of sleep, in which case I'll wake up, my legs will be as stiff as boards, yep. or I can just go there dog-tired, but my muscle's okay. Right. So that's ex we, the way you saw it in the film was exactly how it went down. I know it was an embellishment and it's, it's, it's drama based on, but drinking that, but that pints of water was exactly what I did. Pints of water, wake up and actually go to the toilet, do a bit of stretch, seriously have some cornflakes and milk, and uh, go back to bed for an hour, more water. And they got up in the morning. And I'll tell you exactly how it went down as well. People think, um, how can you just go in there like that and just take a record you failed to get the day before? But I said, I said to the team, I said, right, here's the rub. Um, I'm just going to disappear um, to set the scene correctly. The officials said, we can't go past, you've got to start nine o'clock sharp, not a minute past, because we've got flights, and nationally you're contracted for 24 hours, that's our contract runs up, nine o'clock, on the dot. I said, right, bring the minibus to the hotel, which is five minutes away, bring the minibus at 10 to nine, and I'll get on it with Old Faithful. So, Old Faithful, got to track five to nine, track mitts, helmet, didn't look anybody in the eye. Nobody. St uh, seriously, I strode in at Butch Cassidy. Because if that moment I was Butch Cassidy, I'm coming back to the scene of the battle. Right, let me at it. I did three laps of a warm-up because I had no more energy to spare. Three lap warm-up. Mr. Starter caught me. I was sat in the track. There was dead silence. There was nine people watching this. Yeah. Nine people, including a janitor. <laughs> uh, and Francesca wasn't there, by the way. The film said that Francesca was there, but he wasn't. People think they might have seen him the day before, just in disguise in the audience, but there was no confirmation of that. But he wasn't there the second day. Nine people. Dead quiet. Business starter catches me. I see his chest cavity rising. I knew exactly what he was going to say. I said, are you ready? <laughs> and... The officials all going, oh, went, yes, and I just went, if that's mine, I'm having it. And to be honest, I don't think I've said this anywhere else, but when I got to the corner, we well, don't have corners, the curve of a track. <laughs> um, corner to us, corner. Yeah. I got to the corner, I could see they're all starting the watches. Um, so if Chris hadn't broken the record, really, it should have been like 100 metres less than it was. Really? Because they weren't actually ready. Oh. Um, <laughs> but, but there we are, and then I carried on, broke the record.